try to keep track of the breath. Don't think about the idea that you're going to be here for a whole hour. Just think about this breath, and then this breath, each breath, one at a time. Think about it and watch it. See what it does. What do you notice when it comes in? What do you notice when it goes out? What way of coming in feels best for the body? What way of letting it goes out? <coughs> what way of letting it go out feels best for the body? The breath is called the fabricator of the body or bodily fabrication, Gaya Sankara. Both because it has an impact on the body. The way you breathe is really going to have a huge impact on the way you feel your body. And because there's an intentional element there. It's one of the few bodily processes that can be either voluntary or involuntary. So make the most of this fact that you have some voluntary control over it. You can choose when to breathe in, you can choose when to breathe out. And it's a matter of learning what are the best reasons for choosing to breathe in or breathe out. In other words, can you sense? How does the body tell you that now is the time now is a good time for an in-breath, now is a good time for an out one? It has its signals, you know. There are certain feelings in the body that you'll learn to recognize over time. And then you decide to follow through with them. Take their cue in such a way that it leads to a sense of fullness. In other words, you breathe in and the body feels full. Well, don't squeeze it out. Allow it to stay full. Even though the breath will go out, you can still maintain some sense of fullness. And then the next breath that comes in will add a little bit more fullness. And then the next, and then the next. It builds up over time. In other words, simply by breathing you can create a state of ease, you can create a state of fullness, even a sense of fullness that's a little bit too much. Sometimes people can get to a feeling that they're beginning to drown in breath energy. You may want to temper that a little bit. But as long as the fullness feels refreshing, stick with it. There was once a senior monk in Bangkok who was learning meditation from John Lee. And he'd read his books, read his texts, knew his Buddhist doctrine. And after a while, practicing meditation, he complained to John Lee. He said, aren't we developing states of being and birth? Bhava and Jati are the words he used. As you may have noticed, as we were chanting the Dhamma Jaka just now, the craving that leads to further becoming, or further states of being, that's the craving that leads to suffering as well. And the idea is we're trying to get past states of being and birth, and here we are creating them. And John Lee says, precisely, that's what we're doing. If you want to understand them, you have to consciously create these states. Create a state of well-being, create a state of fullness. Get good at it. And that's when you understand the process. Before you take things apart, you have to learn how to put them together. And that's what we're doing right now. Creating a state of being, a state of well-being. both because we can, can get good at creating it, and in the course of creating it, you've got the mind in a good spot where it can watch things more carefully, more clearly. Because when the mind is comfortable in the present moment, feels at ease in the present moment, it can stay in the present moment and watch processes as they come, as they go. 
and you get a better sense of your raw materials. The creating of a state of being in the mind like this is, is the karma of your meditation right here, right now. A lot of people believe that karma is one of those teachings that's not really relevant to the practice, or at least not relevant to their meditation practice. But essentially it's what the practice is all about. What you're doing that's creating suffering. And again, some people felt will tell you that the Buddha never talked about metaphysical issues. But karma is the big metaphysical issue that he talks about. The nature of action, what action does, when it gives its results. The fact that action is real, that it gives results both immediately and over time. These are metaphysical issues. And the reason the Buddha focuses on these and not on other issues is because the nature of action is important for understanding why we suffer and how we can put an end to suffering. There's the karma that leads to suffering, and then there's the karma that leads to the end of suffering. So we're here trying to understand what action is all about, and what action does, and what it creates. This is our primary example right here. We're creating a state of well-being. You can't let go of states of well-being until you learn how to make good ones. And John Lee's example when he was talking to that senior monk was of a chicken that lays eggs. He says some of the eggs you can take apart and analyze, and other eggs you can eat. If you don't have anything to eat, you don't have the strength to take things apart and analyze. So we're here feeding on the sense of ease that comes from the concentration, because that gives us the strength to analyze things. How do you analyze things? We take things apart in terms of what are you doing and what are the raw materials with which you're doing these things. For example, we all know the teaching that you create a sense of self out of the five aggregates. Well, you can watch yourself as you meditate exactly how do you create a sense of me or mine around what you're doing. For example, you can watch yourself doing it well, or you can watch yourself doing the meditation poorly, and as soon as your idea of self gets involved, you get all tied up in knots. You think you're a bad meditator, or you're a hopeless meditator when things aren't going well. Or you think you're a great meditator when things aren't going well, you get complacent. Either way, you set yourself up for trouble. But when you realize that this is a process of I making and my making, you can leave things at the level of the raw materials. You don't have to make an I out of them. Just notice their feelings, their perceptions, fabrications. And as you watch them even more carefully, you begin to realize that even these aggregates have an element of fabrication. There's an element of intention in them. As the Buddha says, we create form for the sake of formness. You can create formless states as well. This is what you learn when you move from the four jhanas into the four formless states. Infinite space, infinite consciousness. You realize that you do create a sense of form around the body by the way you move the breath around. When the breath is very, very still, that sense of form begins to, to disintegrate, to dissolve. And you have the choice at that point of not applying the perception of form to the body. You suddenly become sensitive to the space that permeates between the atoms in the body and all the spaces in the body. They all connect, and then they connect with the space outside. It's like you have this mist of atoms here. And by the way you breathed and applied perception, perceptions, i.e. labels to things, you had a sense of form of the body. You could move it around. 
but when you don't have to move it around, don't even have to move the breath around, everything, everything goes very still, and you can drop that sense of form if you want to. That's the point when you begin to realize that even the idea of form, or the, percept the experience of form, has an element of intention. And then you begin to see this in terms of the formless realms as well. So what you're doing is you're taking your experience apart layer by layer, seeing where the different levels of intention get involved, and learning how to drop them. As you progressively do away with these layers of intention, you get back to knowledge, what the Buddha calls knowledge of things as they've come to be. And as the Buddha said, it wasn't until he had knowledge of things as they come to be in terms of those four noble truths and the three levels of knowledge about each truth. It wasn't until then that he would claim full awakening. That's what we're getting back to. Now the only way you can get back to that level of unintended, unshaped, unfabricated experience getting that back to the absolutely rawest of the raw materials of the present moment is first by consciously putting them together into something. Otherwise you miss a lot of subtleties. Sometimes you hear people say, well, try to sit with things simply as they are, right from the very beginning of the meditation, and you can get into a state of equanimity. And then you decide that the equanimity is unfabricated. That equanimity and mindfulness, that's it. That's the unfabricated. That's not the case at all. There's a fabrication in mindfulness. There's even a fabrication in equanimity. But unless you've learned how to fabricate equanimity for long periods of time and have learned how to observe it, you won't notice this. So this is why you have to build up these states of concentration before you can start taking them apart. There's a sutta where the Buddha talks about this issue of becoming and non-becoming and things as they come to be. He says there, there are two extremes. There's people who just love becoming this, becoming that, creating states of being as much as they can. And there are other people who want to destroy the states of being. They've gotten sick of what they've done in terms of creating the worlds and the experiences they've had, and they just want to destroy the whole thing. He says, the Buddha says, neither extreme is proper, because in destroying these things you create a, a different kind of state of being. The process of searching for non-becoming, he says, there is becoming there. You, stay on, you take on the identity of the destroyer, the annihilator. The trick is to see simply what has come to be, i.e. look at the raw material that you've been shaping into the present, and see it simply as that, as the raw material, and then learn to develop dispassion for it. One analogy you can use is you've been building houses, and you thought you had bricks. And you turn around and you look at it carefully, then you realize that these bricks you have are frozen meat. Of course, any house you're going to build out of frozen meat, as it gets exposed to the heat, it's just going to turn into this big lump of rotting flesh. And when you see that, you develop dispassion for the houses, you dis develop dispassion for the raw materials. That's when you let go. You don't have to destroy the houses. They're going to disintegrate on their own. The issue here is learning to see the raw material simply as it is as something that's come into being through your past karma. And no matter how skillful you are at building an elaborate house with lots of gingerbread and all kinds of balconies and whatever, it's still frozen meat, and it's going to thaw. So we, when you develop this passion for what's come to be, that's when you find true freedom. You stop this process of fabricating and building and creating states of being. You don't have to destroy the states of being, simply the fact that you've stopped creating them. 
stop clinging to them, that lets them fall away on their own, and you don't replace them with any new ones. So it's a subtle skill. But you can't go straight to the idea of just letting go. First you've got to learn how to build properly. Only then can you see the subtleties of the intentions in the mind. Otherwise you hold on to the intention to be equanimous and think that that's it. Or the intention to be totally passive, non-reactive, think that that's it. Without seeing that that too is an intention, that too has its element of will that keeps it going. So try to be as skillful as you can in staying with the breath and in creating a sense of well-being through the breathing. Because it teaches you a lot of important lessons about the element of karma, the element of will and fabrication that goes into the present moment. It teaches you about the raw materials and the many levels of intention that are there that take these raw materials and turn them into something. So that someday you too can reach that point where after putting things together you can take them apart, see things simply as they've come into being and uh, develop this passion for them and drop them. And that way you can find that you can test for yourself when the Buddha said that there is an unfabricated. You can test for yourself, is that really true? So it may seem like we're going in the opposite direction, but the only way you're going to see what's unfabricated is if you're totally sensitive to every level of fabrication that's possible. So although we're creating a state of being here with the breath, a state of well-being, a state of rapture, ease, unification of mind. As John Lee says, you're going to need to eat some of these eggs. You can't take them all apart. You can't destroy all of them. You've got to eat some of them in order to keep going. So feed yourself well. <laughs>